talk draws inspiration from two sources. Uh, the first is something this guy said. Who is this guy? Yell it out. That's correct. Alex Russell wrote this in a blog post a few months ago about feature detection and UA sniffing and all the stuff that he's presumably talking about tomorrow. And he closed out the post with this. And I knew exactly what he was talking about because I see examples of moralized black and white thinking in the JavaScript community all the time. I see it not so much at conferences like these, but I see it on Stack Overflow and in blog comments and on Usenet, although I suppose that's what Usenet is for. But it worries me because ordinarily developers realize that best practices are highly situational and that what works for someone who's writing a Node app may not work for someone who's on the client side team at Facebook uh, and may not work for the guy who's maintaining is AbeVagodaAlive.com. And in fact, we see that same nuance in other fields. I've read several introductory books that, that uh, for several diverse topics that have this idea that there are rules and you should follow them at first, but over time, you know, you sort of learn the purpose of the rule in the first place and then you can break the rules if you want. Um, that they sort of become guidelines as you get wiser. George Orwell understood it too. He realized that he couldn't write a catch-all set of guidelines for, for using something as complicated as the English language. So he made sure that the reader knew that the rules were less important than the ideas behind them. And that's why I'm worried when I hear people reciting commandments. We shouldn't treat coding practices like morality. And we should be precise in our tutorials and in our evangelism in order to discourage that kind of black and white thinking. The other inspiration was this guy. Who is this guy? Say, say it louder. It is Donald Glover. And he tweeted this last year. And aside from being excellent advice in its own right, I think this is a great way to frame a contrarian argument because you can, you can attack any rule in this manner and you're probably right. So let's treat this as my thesis. Metaphorically, I'm going to mount a defense of shorts, but I'm not saying we should all wear shorts all the time. In fact, some, some of us should never wear shorts ever at all. So I suppose I'm saying that some of us should maybe wear shorts more often. This is the sub-thesis of my talk, that code can be regulated not through rules enforced by language design or by morality, but by the evolution of social customs. And so we should be less concerned about what is right and wrong in best practices than about what is polite and impolite. I think that's a far better way to talk about these things because Politeness has greater situational awareness than morality does. Morality doesn't make many exceptions for context. Like, you can kill a guy if he's trying to kill you, but really, like, but that's about it. And, uh, but as far as politeness, people understand that it depends greatly on context, as is the case with best practices. So I want to approach the topic of extending built-ins from that angle. Um, and sort of look at the past, the present, and the future of it. Prototype has been extending built-ins for years. So let's go back to the beginning and see where its ideas came from. It started out as a tiny collection of convenience functions. Version 1.0 of Prototype was 104 lines of code uh, of a size that you probably wouldn't even bother putting on GitHub these days. Uh, version 1.1 was the first version to feature an interesting piece of code that uh, extends object.prototype. It does so for an arguably use, useful reason. It's nice to be able to merge two objects together, but it, it has a pretty big downside. I've just defined an enumerable property on all my objects. So that means our annoying or helpful method shows up in all four in loops. So there are ways around this. We, you can use has own property to check whether the property belongs to the object itself or to its prototype. And this is Crockford arguing for this very thing. Raise your hand if you write all your for loops like this. Don't, don't lie, you're all on GitHub, I can check. <laughs> all right. So 
nobody listened, or very few people listened. Five trolls in the back listened, apparently. Um, so there was, just, there was no chance of this happening. And I know because Crockford told us to do it, and we didn't do it. Um, for one thing, Safari 2.0 and below didn't support has own property, and that was important at the time. Um, but also, this is a major chore, and you've got to do it every single time you write a for in loop. And it's hard to convince people to opt into a chore. Um, it's easier to, to dictate what people shouldn't do than what they should. Eric Arvidson, now of Google and a contributor to ECMAScript, suggested a different approach back in 2005. He said, we should just agree to be hands-off with, with object.prototype. And this was, an e this was easier to enforce because there are far fewer people who want to extend object.prototype than there are people who want to use for in loops. So this is what we, the community ended up doing instead. But I find this fascinating. This is how he starts off the post. It is not seldom that you see people messing with object.prototype. It was apparently not seldom that in mid-2005, people were doing this sort of thing. So I imagine the prototype wasn't the only offender. And then one of the comments um, to the post explains that, no, it's, it's totally OK to add whatever you want to object.prototype. You just have to use has own property, and then you have to implement it um, in browsers that don't support it. So if you want to add n methods to object.prototype, you just have to add n plus 1, and you're, you're totally fine. Um, and it's revealing, because the comment assumes that you write all the code. And I'm sure that was true for the commenter, but we were very quickly moving toward a model where most of the code that runs on a page wasn't written by the page's owner. Um, and the fact that we were having this conversation in the first place shows that, that, that this was sort of already upon us, because no one, we don't need to have conversations about manners if we're all, if we're all hermits. So between 1.3 and 1.4, prototype changed. It moved object.prototype.extend to object.extend. If legend is to be believed, this was largely the work of Dean Edwards. Um, as it was told to me, Dean emailed Sam Stevenson, Sam Stevenson one day and said, so I'm going to write a blog post recommending against using prototype because it extends object.prototype. I really like prototype, and I really don't want to have to do that. So Instead, I hope you'll just change prototype, and Sam did, and I think it was a good move. I think both Dean and Sam did the right thing there. And as a result, that was the first and last time that prototype ever touched object.prototype. Of course, prototype has extended other built-in objects since the beginning. Um, for a while, the only method added to arrays, though, was push, uh, and only in environments where it, it didn't exist, like Internet Explorer 5. But prototype 1.4 had innumerable, which had a lot of methods for iterating over arrays. So in, in version 1.4, prototype went from adding nothing to array.prototype, except in Explorer 5, to adding around 30 methods. And that broke some code in the, in, in the wild. And there are a couple of odd legitimate use cases for doing for in on arrays. People have argued for sparse arrays um, and using for in on those so that you don't have to loop through a bunch of undefined properties. But for most for in usage in the wild was just dumb. And most, like, most people were treating arrays like hashes when they could just as easily have used objects. And so I said so five years ago, I think. Um, I said that using arrays as, has, as hashes is no more reasonable than using string objects or regular expression ob objects or anything else as a hash. Uh, and it became the most popular thing I've ever written. But So I wasn't even a prototype developer back then. But buried in this article is the idea that prototype m may not be for everyone. Um, if someone had said to me, you know, I'd love to use prototype, but I've got dumb third-party code on my page that does for in over arrays, and I can't replace it, um, and I can't change it, I, I, said, I would have said, that sucks. You should probably use another framework. Um, prototype was never trying to conquer the world. It was happy to be a love it or hate it kind of thing. Uh, there's one more area to cover quickly. In um, 1.5, we started adding things to DOM nodes. In general, it made working with the DOM far less painful, but it pushed prototype into a, a minefield though we may not have realized it at the time. 
We can extend elements cheaply in most browsers with these, with our convenience methods. But not in IE, because you weren't able to, do, to augment DOM objects prototypes until version 8. So in Explorer, we had to copy them over manually one by one as elements were retrieved. And we tried to optimize this as much as possible, but it was still a huge performance bottleneck. And it, it was a millstone around our necks in the selector engine wars. We ran into other problems, too. Over time, it became clearer and clearer that host objects behave in unpredictable ways and weren't converging on any sort of common behavior. Uh, and it's because host objects, by definition, don't have to abide by any rules. Um, and so we were stuck with this approach for backward compatibility, but we decided the prototype 2.0 would have wrappers around DOM nodes and event objects instead of augmenting them directly. Uh, I, a year ago, Kangax wrote the, defini the definitive article about this sort of thing. Um, and I agree with just about everything he says in this article. And I would even agree that this was the biggest mistake prototype ever made. But if I may segue out of prototype and into general best practices. Um, Nicholas Zakis' article about not modifying objects you don't own, I think, is also relevant. And I see it referenced all over the place, and I have no quarrel with the basic arguments. But let's apply this to built-ins. Don't modify objects you don't own. All right, who owns built-ins? We might say that the language owns built-ins, but then they're not the most diligent of caretakers. There are things that we've needed for ages, like trim on strings or like uh, collection methods on arrays that we were that that got added very slowly over time, because the process of specification is necessarily slow. And when I say I shouldn't modify that object because I don't own it, I'm saying it's not my job to modify it. It's someone else's job. And so if something's not working right in a third-party library I'm using, uh, I could monkey patch it to work the way I want. But I should probably just file a bug with the library maintainer, because it's their job to fix it. But nobody claims to provide this level of service for built-ins. I think we all own built-ins. I think they're shared property. And as a result, they have all the upsides and downsides of shared property. It's mine to use, and I'm trusted to use it in a way that doesn't mess it up for other people. So rules regarding shared property are just as much about courtesy as they are, as they are about law. So we come back to this idea of social customs in code, relying not on the language's rules for what is allowed, but on guidelines that we develop ourselves uh, over time and, and through negotiation. And this is just like real life, where we have roads and sidewalks and parks that we all pay for and we all get to use. Uh, and in public, there are many, many bastardly things that you can do, but you don't because you don't want to be a dick. And most of us are sensitive to that and to the, like, the community's agreed upon standards of politeness. Uh, and we already have this in JavaScript. This is how we decided that object.prototype was, um, that we were going to treat it as a DMZ. And we've got people like Doug Crockford who writes Emily Post-like lists of do's and don'ts. And we've got people like John Resig who, rather, rather, than, rather than write it down, um, further their ideas of politeness through the code they write. And it's all great. And it's not the sort of thing... Oops. Where's my pointer? There we are. Um, we shouldn't run from this sort of thing. Um, because it's a powerful force, and it makes the language better. This doesn't happen in Java, where like, the language itself outlaws anything that anyone might consider rude. And in that sense, it's a lot like Singapore. But JavaScript is a lot less authoritarian and more, um, as a result, more adaptive to evolving customs. I know all this because I've seen it happen in the Ruby community. Because Ruby has, has evolved quite a bit in the last seven years, because of the influence of Rails. And because near, nearly everything is possible in Ruby itself, the language has evolved primarily through the influence of community norms. Um, there are some of us who think that taking ideas from other languages is wrong somehow, that it shows you're stuck in a non-JavaScript mindset. Uh, I don't really buy into that, because Ruby and JavaScript are remarkably similar. Um, they share a small talk influence. JavaScript took a detour through self. 
um, which is a, the small talk offshoot that introduced the idea of prototypal inheritance. But their design ideas are otherwise very much in agreement. Um, from the beginning, Rails took full advantage of Ruby's dynamism. Rails is basically a collection of dependencies, and one of them is called Active Support, and it holds all of Rails' extensions to Ruby's standard library. And it's got stuff like this. So because you can add stuff to the numeric class that's sort of the superclass of both integers and floats, you can have a terse expressive syntax for describing time spans and dates in the future or the past, or for describing quantities of bytes or megabytes. Um, and I find that most people, when they, when they see this, think either, holy shit, that's awesome, I would use that all the time, or holy shit, that's ridiculous, please never show that to me again. Um, but this is a less polarizing example. Um, so if you need to iterate over a collection and call an instance method on, on each item, you can, um, you can do it the first way in Ruby, which is sort of, sort of the, the explicit way of defining um, defining a block, which is basically a function. Um, or you can do it the second way, um, because active support defines a coercion rule for converting a symbol into, uh, into a function, um, much the same way that there, there are implicit conversions, uh, implicit coercions in JavaScript, like toString and value of. Um, and so active support defined one of those coercion rules for, for symbols where one didn't exist before. So this didn't break anything um, and was a really sort of concise way to describe something that people needed to do very often. And so this was widely regarded in the Ruby community as a good idea, so much so that it's actually now in the, in the language itself. Um, and, all, and all the major Ruby engines implement it natively. And it reminded me of something that happened in JavaScript. Uh, way back in 2004, a Swedish programmer named Daniel Brockman wrote a white paper about partial application in JavaScript um, and ways to rebind scope. And the paper takes us through several iterations, but we eventually end up with this. And as far as I know, this was the first appearance of function.prototype.bind in the wild. And apparently Sam Stevenson stumbled upon it sometime later because bind has been in prototype since the very first version. And if we look at the old prototype 1.0 website, we see Daniel's name in the list of contributors. Uh, at first, bind only rebounds, rebounds scope. That's all it did, both as defined in Daniel's white paper and as implemented in prototype. But by prototype 1.4, it was rewritten to support partial application by passing extra arguments to the original function, uh, much like you would do with, with call. Um, so think about that and, and the fact that specs don't always get it right the first time. We saw that with call and apply. Call was great, but it failed to address the case where you need to pass some arguments along, but you might not know exactly how many of them there are. Um, so we needed, we needed to apply for that case. Um, and so now bind is in the ES5 spec, and it's certainly the case that the spec, the spec probably would have gotten around to implementing bind, even without its widespread use. It's not like this was an idea that, that nobody would have thought of. But I wonder if they would have gotten it right the first time. Or, or would, it, would it have looked like Daniel's first version? The fact that we can define it and use it in real world code um, also lets us see what we might change about it. And that's a proving ground for APIs that specs can't really compete with. Um, for me, that's the greatest value of grassroots improvements to the language. Um, but back to Ruby. So I gave you two examples of active support enhancements. One of them is hugely popular, and the other is still divisive. Um, the drawback of social customs and code is the occasional act of rudeness. People will write stupid code, as they always do, but their stupid code will sometimes get in your way, and vice versa. Uh, Zed Shaw is an infamous ex-Rubyist. He's primarily known for writing code and yelling at people. And he's very good at both, and sometimes they run in parallel. Um, and he's able to deliver impassioned rants about good and bad code. And once he had a terrible time debugging an issue that turned out to be caused by someone else's dumb monkey patch. And he posted on Usenet about it because, again, that's what Usenet is for. 
um, he writes, not only does this code reopen a class to do something that, that could just as easily be done with subclassing, but the, off, the author also turns off documentation so that nobody knows about it. So much for principle of least surprise, this is more like principle of most heinous arsenic injection. Please think of the children before you reopen their parent with a damn chainsaw. Um, the web is awesome because it assigns ideas permalinks. And I can't tell you how often people answer Ruby questions um, in news groups and on Stack Overflow and, in, and on forums by linking to the chainsaw infanticide logger maneuver. It's one of the major contributors to Ruby's current community standards of, of polite core extensions uh, and polite monkey patching. Um, I'm partial to a similar fable on rubyforum.com. Uh, someone had asked about doing something self-consciously clever with a constructor so that uh, a certain method would always magically get called at the end of initialization. Um, and someone wrote, that may look good now, but someone who is debugging some code which depends on it will hate you. And when you're debugging six months from now, you'll hate yourself. If you really want to do this, put some real effort into, into designing a clean API for it. Make it obvious that you're putting a twist in the, on the conventional method calling chain. Document the API so it's obvious in a coherent, readily understandable way. Don't slip a concrete dildo into someone's box of Fruit Loops. <laughs> they won't be happy with your morning breakfast surprise. Put the concrete dildo in a clearly labeled box with instructions. <laughs> then when someone encounters a problem, hey, something is screwing me here, maybe it's the concrete dildo. <laughs> At least they know to ask. Um, Yehuda Katz is a major figure in both Ruby's community and ours, and he said something interesting recently in um, the comments of one of his blog posts. It's occasionally the case that a, that a core extension in active support will conflict with a core extension in another Ruby library. And the commenter asked him why, when this happens, it's usually the other library that's expected to change. Um, and he replied with this, and it makes sense to me, if generalized extensions to built-ins are a privilege, we can choose to grant that privilege to exactly one library in order to minimize the risk of conflict. In practice, this is what the Ruby community has done. Rather than have a bunch of libraries that try to enhance the language, um, they've standardized around active support in practice. Um, and it, it gives us a sort of, uh, 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 it gives us a way to go forward in JavaScript, I think. Um, make mental note of all of the libraries that you use on your website and count how many of them try to um, uh, provide language extensions, how many of them extend built-ins. If the answer is more than one, you've probably got a problem. If the answer is exactly one, everything is fine. And if the answer is zero, then you should probably be defining some lang language, ex language extensions yourself um, or else you're putting plastic on a couch like our grandparents used to do. So Ruby has learned a few things from these fights, and they're all applicable to the JavaScript community as well. First of all, if your code extends built-ins, make it plainly obvious to anyone either reading the code um, or reading the documentation. It shouldn't be a surprise. Um, second, because active support is a collection of largely separate language enhancements, um, it's also useful that you can require just parts of it r rather than the whole thing. Um, and that minimizes the chance of collisions. Uh, and yes, you can monkey patch, but do so as a last resort and in a way that ensures that you won't break the method. Luckily, there's a strong testing ethos in the, in the Ruby community. So when a library monkey patches something, it's usually got a crap load of, of unit tests to ensure that the method still works as, as expected. But as I see it, there's still two big problems left that can't be solved in modern-day Ruby, and unfortunately, both of them are also applicable to JavaScript. The first is the thing that we just talked about. I can, I can grant the privilege of extending built-ins to one library, but only one. Um, Zakis' blog post mentions Immanuel Kant's test for determining if an act is moral. What if everyone did it? Would it create chaos? Um, and despite the fact that that frames best practices in, in terms of morality. Um, I think that's a legitimate question. Um, I find this troubling. On one hand, um, 
it's a privilege that's freely agreed upon between the privileged library and the user. There's no coercion involved or anything. Um, but it does start me off down a path of picking and choosing my dependencies based on which core extensions they rely upon. For prototype, this has been a problem. Um, there are cases where prototype has run into conf conflicts with other libraries that extend built-ins, uh, most notably ext, and there's no easy way around that. And I don't want people to have to choose between prototype and something else. The other problem is related to, the, to this. When I use Rails, it pulls in active support and all of its core extensions. Is it doing that for me, or is it doing that for Rails? Like, does, does Rails extend built-ins just so Rails can use those built-in extensions, or is it also stuff that it thinks that I would find useful? It's a bit of both, but the point is that once a library requires a core extension, it's out there, visible to everyone, whether, whether they ask for it or not. So I've given the, the historical perspective, and now that the language is evolving, we're getting tools to deal with some of this stuff. Uh, is there any way we can extend built-ins safely right now? Like, say we wanted to bring back object.prototype.extend in a less annoying fashion. So we couldn't write it like this. We could do something like this. ES5 now let us, lets us define a property, set its value, and mark it as non-enumerable. Uh, so we can prevent it from showing up in four in, four in loops. So our, our, our example from before seems to work now, um, only twice th through the loop uh, instead of three times. We might be tempted to stop now and declare victory, but um, there are a couple of other problems. What if I have an object with a key called extend? I can't call my extend method on it the way I want. It's been shadowed. My property shadows the one on the prototype. This is the problem with having to use objects as hashes. Uh, and then there's this, which is far sneakier. Anything you add to object.prototype will be added to window, or whatever your global object is. And because it's the global scope, any unqualified reference to that identifier will point to the global copy. As far as I know, there's nothing you can do about this either. Uh, this will happen even in strict mode. And as I understand it, these issues are part of the reason why all the new ES5 stuff um, is landing on object rather than object.prototype. If, if we had object.prototype.define property, We'd, have, we'd be creating a global define property function also. So even in ES5, there's no safe way to extend object.prototype in the general case. Uh, for other built-ins, it's not so bad, because you don't have to worry about key collisions, because you're not using those objects as, as hashes. Um, if you're defining extensions for an ES5-only environment like Node, you should seriously think about defining all, all those extensions as non-enumerable. Um, if you're defining extensions in an environment that may or may not have ES5 stuff, it's not as simple. Uh, prototype could define all of its array extensions as non-enumerable in ES5 environments, but then we'd have a weird situation where those extensions would get enumerated in, in some browsers, but not in others. And I'm not sure that's progress. Um, but speaking of ES5-only environments, um, Node is a homogeneous environment. You don't have to worry about that sort of thing. And it supports all the ES5 awesomeness. So surely this is a safe place to extend built-ins. Um, I saw that Too Tall Nate released a Node time li library a few weeks back. And it's a perfect example of, of what I think Node should be doing with built-ins. It augments the built-in date object in JavaScript to, uh, to add support for time zones. So you, you require the library. Your date object is enhanced, and when you create is enhanced, and when you create a new date, it'll have methods for setting and getting the time zone. And once you set the time zone, all date methods will take the time zone into account when returning values. It's minimally invasive and highly valuable. It's adding three or four methods to dates that are highly unlikely to, con to conflict with anything. Um, there's one more browser topic, though, that we should talk about. The browser has always been an uneven land landscape. And we've, we've always had to deal with varying capabilities across browsers. And the, dispar the, the disparity will only get broader now that we've got ES5. So why not smooth it out? Back in the day, it was common to implement array, um, the push method on arrays, or apply on functions for browsers that didn't support them. And there seems to be widespread agreement that we should try to do this um, for ES5 which is a weird sort of thing. It's, it's sort of the, like the opposite of paving the cow paths. Rather than, rather than take something that everybody is doing and, standard, and standardize it, we're taking something that's 
agreed to be standard in a future spec and sort of like retconning it into, a, into our existing narrative. Um, but it's something that everybody seems to be behind. So here's a version of object.keys for ES3, taken directly from the Mozilla Developer Center docs, which are great because for any ES5 method that's implementable in ES3, they, they will have the example implementation right there on the page. Uh, prototype already had an object.keys method, so we had to change it to, to conform to the spec, including throwing the type error if you give it a non-object. Um, so it technically broke backward compatibility, but the impact of the change was minimal. Um, likewise, here's MDC's version of bind. It's very similar to, in behavior to the one in ES5. Um, it's not quite identical. There's a lot of nuanced behavior in the ES5 version that we can't quite replicate, but it's all minor stuff. To get us started on the idea of safe, sensible built-in extension, I'm proposing the least controversial idea I can think of. Let's start depending on function.prototype.bind. I would love to see this snippet of JavaScript become the world's most widely used polyfill. Let's treat it as the canonical definitive way to bind scope in JavaScript. Now, every library already has a way to bind scope, but that's kind of the problem. Every library has its own way of binding scope. Um, I think we're talking about something that's so basic to the understanding of the language that it shouldn't be a library function. New JavaScript users struggle mightily with scope. Um, it doesn't really help that each library has a different way of doing it. And a lot of people, I think, just throw up their hands and write var that equals this and uh, just to be done with it. Um, and I'm sure I'm biased, but I've seen no library function that can compete with the terseness and simplicity of bind. If I run into a scope issue, if I see that my callback isn't executing in the scope I thought it would, I can just add dot bind this to the end of the function and, and everything works. So that's my proposal. I think we should take that bind polyfill and make sure it's pulled into every website we make. Uh, Prototype is going to complete its ES5 conformance in the next minor version. Um, we'll change our version of bind to match the polyfill, and we'll do the same for the rest of, of our collisions with built-in ES5 methods. And this is part of the contract, I think. If a method in your library ends up getting standardized somehow, make sure your version agrees with the spec and change it if it doesn't, um, even if it breaks backward compatibility. That way you can take advantage of the more performant native version if it's there. So we've done past and present, and uh, so let's take a look at what the future holds. There are still a couple of large problems that prevent us from extending built-ins completely safely in JavaScript. Um, but class boxes are a new idea in language development. And by a new idea, I, I mean it's about eight years old. But that's often how long it takes to go from conception to implementation. Um, the aim is to, to bridge the gap between classical module systems and environments where everything is mutable. Class boxes, let me say, I want to, I want to make these changes to existing classes um, and isolate those changes so that they affect only me and nobody else. Class boxes are finding their way into Ruby 2.0. There's a proposal and there's even a patch for it, and they're called refinements instead of class boxes because there are subtle differences in semantics. But the idea is the same. Refinements would mean that I could define some awesome time extensions, like you know the ones that you hate and I think are awesome, and I can import them into an arbitrary lexical scope. Here we're, we're importing them file-wide, but I could just as easily import them into a single class or a single method. And then other people's code doesn't have to see it at all. Only lexical scopes that have imported these refinements will see them. Um, it's still not certain that this will make it into Ruby 2.0, but the response has been very positive. So if it's good enough for Ruby, why not JavaScript? For a long time, I thought this kind of thing had been explicitly ruled out as part of the Harmony Compromise, but um, I was pleased to find out that I was wrong. Um, just last week, there was, a, there was a straw man posted to the ECMAScript wiki called Scoped Object Extensions. Um, the usual caveats apply for straw men, but here's how it might work. Uh, so inside a module block, you can use an extension keyword along with an object you want to class box, like number.prototype in this example. And we're also giving that extension a name so we can refer to it later. 
And we can add whatever we want to that extension with our ordinary object literal syntax. Then, again, in any lexical scope, we can import these extensions um, as we're doing here instead of, instead of a function. So we're able to say, I want, I want to use these extensions here, just within this function, but nowhere else. Um, this is the sort of thing that would finally solve the outstanding issues that prevent built-in extensions from being 100% safe. So this is still a straw man, which means there's no guarantee it'll happen. But, also, but even if everyone agrees this is a good idea, it's, it's, still, it's too late for harmony. Um, so we're looking at es.next at the very earliest. Uh, but the, the, the silver lining is that we've got environments like Node now where um, people can use things as soon as they're implemented. It's, uh, it's not like uh, client-side web development where you have to wait like five or 10 years um, before a feature is, wide, is widely deployed enough that you can start using it. So I'm going to boldly predict that this will be in the language someday, uh, maybe a thousand years from now, but, but someday. Um, I'm optimistic about it because I'm tired of having these awesome features that we can't use. Uh, and I eagerly await a time when we can finally extend built-ins without the traditional downsides, at which point hopefully, you know, we'll we can stop having dumb arguments about this and apologize to each other for all the hurtful things that we've said and just get back to writing code. Um, that's all I've got. Uh, we have time for a couple questions, I think. So, so the question was that a lot of my examples featured a sort of like domain-specific language type syntax and, and, and wondering whether uh, built-in extension was the way to address that. And, um, you know, that's, that, that's a valid point, and I, should, I shouldn't... Um, but I, like, I, I don't think that my examples necessarily reflect like, the breadth of, of what active support actually does with, with built-in extension. Um, I'm, all, I'm all for other types of enhancements to support those, those, those kinds of things, um, like, like the proxy objects that we're getting in Harmony, and hopefully something that we'll replace with in a way that's not as awful as with, so that we can do more DSL type stuff. Um, all right, if it's quick. How would you say the uh, efforts of common JS modules relate to um, your, your proposal of a standard polyfill of object upbind? Um, common JS modules are, are interesting. Um, and th this was something that I, that, I, that I cut out from the talk because I didn't really have time to, to address it. Um, yeah, like, if, if I were writing a node app, then like, I imagine that I would have some module that, that I pull in that would define, that would do all of my built-in extension. I mean, that's, that's the way that I would do it personally. Um, it's also the case that um, there's, the node community is sort of experimenting with the idea of running modules in a, in, in, in a sandbox where they can't even get at your built-ins. Um, and I think, I think that's, in, that's an interesting dynamic that's going to play out um, over the next year or so. Um, I think, I mean, it's such, it's such a, a tiny piece of code that I think that people should inject into, into their environment however they like. Um, all right, I'm out of time, but thank you all. Uh, you know there are planes, Chris. We didn't have to take a wagon to Oregon.